Please open to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. As you know, I'm not in the best of shape. When your pastor's trying to find the book of Haggai and he gives up searching for it, then you know that he's in trouble, okay? So, I, I almost thought that book of the Bible didn't exist for a moment. All right. Well, anyway, if you can pray for me, uh, this might be sloppy, but I'm just going to preach the best that I can. This passage is about Jesus Christ as he washes the feet of his disciples, demonstrating a great example of being a servant, of getting outside of one's own comfort zone and getting outside to minister to other people. And what all of that is seen is joy. When one gets out of his or her comfort zone and ministers to other people, the Lord defines this as joy. You'll notice, I'll re skip a few verses, but in verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. We will skip down <coughs> at verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. As you can imagine, here is Jesus Christ, who is used, used to all the splendor and glory of heaven, and who is used to be being addressed as master and as Lord, he would put aside his own garment, stoop himself down, stoop himself low to pick up the feet of his own disciples. Disciples whom he corrected, whom he rebuked, whom he has authority over. Disciples who are sinners compared to Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus Christ would take the feet of such wretched sinners, stoop himself down lower than them, not even at their level. He was already at their level when he went through the incarnation, when God became man. But God was willing to stoop lower than man by taking their feet. Below men by taking the bottom of man, their feet. And wash their feet, and you can imagine as he washed their feet during that time when the Jews were washing their feet, it was smelly, and it wasn't like that they had socks and shoes like you and I did. And they didn't have all the hygiene uh, resources and materials like you and I had. Jesus Christ had to take their stinky feet. And it was within, they were wearing sandals. So then they had to get all the grime, the dirt. And who knows, maybe outside over there, there were just disgusting things that they tread upon. We went to Palermo, Italy, and we thought we were landing in San Francisco. There was dung every corner of the road. I think I stepped on one, but I wasn't sure. But uh, you should have saw Brother Jared's facial reaction. He just kept going, Ugh, uh, uh, uh. I said, Jared, just look at the person in front of you walking. Don't look at the ground. <laughs> it was just that bad. But you can imagine the, those feet that tread upon all kinds of dirt or disgusting things. And they went around all day that way. And Jesus Christ had to wash those stinky feet. Stinky feet. With his own hands and these are the hands who created all the worlds into existence, that flung the stars out throughout the galaxies. Those precious hands he was willing to take dirty, stinking feet, stoop himself low, wash their feet. Now, 
thinking about all that, how can anyone call that joy? Jesus said so. If you read that last verse, we read it. If you know these things, happy. Happy. How can one be happy stooping himself lower than other people? Okay. Stooping himself so low as to clean up dirt off of other people. Have you ever cleaned off dirt from other people before? That ain't fun. That can be a lot of pressure. It can be a lot of pain. It can be a lot of things that you have to put up with the smell that people leave behind. Not just physical feet, physical stench, but even things that we go through in our everyday life. There are things that you have to clean up people's feet. And there is no joy in that if you're to think logically. If you're to think sensibly. How can one have joy? How can one be happy? It's very strange. Well, if I were to look at the world around me, I can see that pretty much everyone around the world, that they're pretty selfish. They don't like to wash people's feet. They want their own feet to be washed. They want to be the ones to be benefited off of other people. They want to have the riches. They want to have the nice houses. They want people to serve them. They don't want to be the ones to serve others because there's no joy in serving others. That's how they think. But when you look at the world around you, they're not happy. See, so things that you do to benefit yourself does not bring true happiness, that means. But when you serve others, Jesus insists that there is joy, there is happiness in that. Because if there is a monster that you do not want to feed, that will never experience joy, that is you. That is you. The Bible says that the flesh is never satisfied. Desire is never satisfied. Desire can grow as large as hell. And that's a bottomless pit that will never feel, that will never reach the point of completeness and satisfaction. So we do know this. If we have others serve us, if we're the ones on the receiving end of the benefits, that doesn't give us joy. It increases misery. How does service to others bring you joy? We're going to examine these things together and see the mystery, but a true power behind serving others. As a matter of fact, if you were to study a bunch of empirical journals, it's very interesting. They have a term what they call otherishness. And in otherishness, when you serve other people, it does something to you in return. It benefits you. It's not actually completely sacrificing self and only thinking about others. They actually insist that when you serve others with no benefit of self, with that kind of motivation, what happens is, is that it somehow reciprocate, reciprocates and it is somehow bounces back the benefit to you. So this is secular empirical journals. And all you have to do is just type down otherishness and investigate it yourself. So this is a real thing, the mystery and the power of serving others. I want us to examine ourselves on why we're not really happy, why we're not really serving God with joy. And the key thing is perhaps there's a little bit of yourself in there rather than others. We need to investigate this and perhaps the Lord can show you the joy of others. Now, Father, will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood? Help me to preach what you want me to preach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we look at verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Do you understand here? Jesus, he knows everything. He knows everything, what the Father had given to him. And he was come from God and he went to God. But another thing about Jesus Christ is that he is God. If he is God, he should know 
many things, if not all things. He should be able to have the omniscience. Now, take it for granted, there might be times when in his human form, he was willing to limit himself to human knowledge, which is restricted, which is limited. However, the point is, Jesus Christ, he is God, and if he wanted to, he can have access to omniscience and to all knowledge. If he is all knowledge, then in verse 4 and 5, why did he have to rise up from supper, put aside his garments, take a towel, gird himself, and then wash the disciples' feet? Why does he have to know about service? Why does he have to know about the joy of serving others if he already knows? Is he not God? He does not have to. Do you understand? He does not have to wash other people's feet because he already knows the joy of serving others. If he knows about that, he does not even have to do it. Yet God, in spite of his omniscience, in spite of knowing the joys of servitude, he decided anyway that I will commit the act of service to experience the joy of serving others. Not just knowing it. He knows the service of joy. So he doesn't have to do it because he's God. You don't think that God knows everything and he knows the benefits of others? So why would he have to do an act like that if he is God, if he knows everything? Because God, in spite of knowing, realized that the experience, the action was very important. The verse says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. If you actually serve other people, you receive joy in the end. Not just knowing, but actually doing. Jesus doesn't have to wash people's feet, correct? Jesus does not have to experience foot washing to teach you about serving others because he's God. But Jesus Christ said at verse 14 and 15, I have to give an example so that you can follow that. The bottom line is this. God knows that he has every right and he is capable and he has all the knowledge of the benefits of serving others, the joy of serving others. If he says so, his word is true. No buts and no questions about it. But he had to do it anyway because he realized how important it is to actually go through the experience, to actually do them, not just knowing. We know that the word of God is true. We know that the Word of God has no errors, and we know that His promises are actually real and minister to us, and they help us. Praise God for the King James Bible, for the Word that never passeth away. But just knowing the Word and having it pales in comparison when you're actually doing them. The Bible says, be doers, doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. It's one thing to know about God's promises, but isn't it very different to experience God's promises? Huge difference, is it not? If you and I experience what God has blessed us in our lives, that is definitely a lot more different. The feeling is much more different. Even the knowledge is much more different compared to just hearing and knowing about it from a sermon. 
You need to actually do, you need to actually experience to know what real joy is behind God's blessing. Not just hearing or knowing about it. If you and I know the joy of a revival meeting, of a blowout, of preachers getting together and then they minister to you the word of God, man, it's one thing to know about it and to watch it online, but it's definitely different if you actually experience it. If you actually put aside your garments, put aside what you know about the blowout being good and just actually going in there and actually being at a part of the foot washing. Boy, the revival meeting was people washing each other's feet. And we, preachers were washing your feet and we were washing theirs, taking them out to eat and giving them money. And the preachers were washing your feet by preaching the word of God and then helping you out. When we're all in the foot washing business together, there's real joy into that. But if we were in our comfort zone back at home and just watching about it online and hearing about it online, all right, hearing it through word of mouth from other people, that's a blessing. You're not going to receive joy. There's a huge difference with knowing and actually doing. We hear stories about souls getting saved from other people in this church. And especially like Jonathan Goforth, when he was walking to work and walking to a church meeting, he would just lead souls to salvation on the way. And Finney, where he would shut down a whole factory where the people just stopped working and he would convert all of them to Jesus Christ. Man, it stirs your heart. But that ain't real joy. That doesn't really stir your heart compared to actually being one of them and actually doing it. Until you get out of your comfort zone, see, and actually do the witnessing yourself, be the one to pass out the track, be the one to witness to those souls, you experience the joy of serving others. What's that? Foot washing. The feet of lost sinners and bringing them to Jesus Christ. You know, we love God, we love Jesus Christ, and we can serve Him in our own homes. But it is far different just knowing about it and knowing the Word of God and knowing the right doctrines and knowing God's promises stuck at home compared to getting out of your comfort zone and driving all the way here and fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ signing up the volunteer sheet, going out, witnessing with them and fellowshipping with them and teaching each other and participating in any activity and even to the point of just cleaning up the building or the bathrooms. That is far different than just staying stuck at home and just knowing and just knowing the joy of church. You got to be in church to know the joy of church, not just know it and stay at home. We know those hymns minister to our hearts. We know that, right? Sinners say by grace, good words, all hail Emmanuel, great words. But they won't minister to you until you actually do them. Until you actually do them with other saints. They minister to your heart. What's the point? The point is, are you stuck in your comfort zone just knowing about the joy of the Lord, or are you going out and doing it? Wow, is Isn't this great about the great reports you hear from Campaigns for Christ on how many uh, John and Romans were passed out? Isn't it great to hear about the church, how they received the blessing in Europe, and how they were able to minister to other churches? Praise the Lord, that made you happy, but that ain't real joy. Real joy is not just knowing or hearing. It's getting out of your comfort zone and not just hearing and knowing in your comfort zone. Getting out of it and ministering to other people. Actually doing the foot washing. How many feet have you washed? Or are you stuck in your comfort zone and just knowing? When's the last time that you, like Jesus Christ, put aside his garments 
girdled himself, stooped down low, and washed the person's feet? Or are you stuck in your comfort zone and just knowing about the joy of the Lord? You know what I promise you? If you keep just knowing the joy of the Lord rather than experiencing it, you will doubt the joy of the Lord one day. You're going to lose your faith in God one day. God's never going to give you real joy until you actually do it. Don't just know it. Don't just hear it. Do it. Get out of your comfort zone. Come to church. Get out of your comfort zone. Participate in the revival meetings. Get out of your comfort zone. Fellowship with other brethren. Get out of your local comfort zone. Go to other parts of the world and see the joy. See the joy of what you've heard from other people. About people being hungry for the word of God. People getting saved and brethren whose lives were changed. People of different nationalities worshiping the one true God, a man named Jesus Christ, and raising up an English King James Bible. Unheard of before. What you heard and what you've known, be a part of that and go out there. Get out of your local comfort zone and go outside and see what it's like out there. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're going to develop a self-mentality more and more. Okay. And that self-mentality really robs you of your joy in the Lord. Even though you know about it so much. You know one thing I've learned? I know so much about the joy of the Lord. I can pull up verses, doctrines, and I posted endless videos about it. I preached endless sermons about it. But guess what? It didn't do me any good until I actually okay. done those things until I actually washed the feet of the disciples. And then I knew what I preached and what I knew about the joy of the Lord was real. But if I stay stuck in my air-conditioned office, in my uh, local church, and then think about building my own little kingdom here and making a name for myself, and then getting other people out of their comfort zone to come to my comfort zone, I don't know if that made any sense. When I do that, I develop a more selfish mentality and I develop more misery and depression. But until I get out of my comfort zone and go to where other people are and outside of it, I experience the joy of the Lord. You want joy? If you're so discontent and if you're so depressed living here in America with all of its prosperity and money, let me give you good advice. Get out of America for a week. That is good and healthy for you. Get out of America for a week. Get into other Bible-believing churches and develop friends over there and see what the Lord can do. Good, healthy advice. Well, I just can't do that. and I, It's just so hard. And uh, I, I don't know if that's really true or not. You know what's going on? You have a self-mentality in your comfort zone. You're locked. You're imprisoned there. You need to get out of that. In John chapter 13, notice in uh, verse 6, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? <coughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, Why do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter? Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. <laughs> you know who was the one who... Uh, told Jesus Christ not to serve, you would think it would be Judas Iscariot. He would be the one who would hinder the Lord's service. But it ain't a Judas Iscariot. That's too easy. If you look at the verses behind it, Judas Iscariot was already cast out. You know who it was? It was the prime pinnacle leader of the early Christian church. It was the Apostle Peter. The head honcho in charge. That was the guy who hindered Jesus Christ from his service to other people. It was a spiritual man, spiritual prime leader. Hey, as you're washing the disciples' feet, do you have a spiritual Peter that tells you, hey, don't wash their feet? He's spiritual after all, Peter. 
And he gave you a spiritual excuse to not wash other people's feet. He'll probably say, you got to take care of your family. They're very important, which is true. It's a spiritual excuse. Hey, you got to uh, work in your job. You got to make money and take care of them. The Bible says if you don't provide for your house and, you know, you're an infidel. See, that's spiritual. Probably say, no, don't witness to that soul. Just use your testimony. No, that's spiritual. You know what Peter will do? He'll give a spiritual excuse to prevent you from washing somebody else's feet. There will come a Peter in your life that will prevent you from getting out of your comfort zone to serve God. You know what Peter's going to say to you? Peter's going to tell you that, hey, uh, you know, you're just too hot-headed. You know, you're just overzealous. So don't go out there and ruin your whole life. You might make a mistake. You're not called. You're not capable to carry on that task to wash that person's feet. That's what Peter will do. Think about it. If you join the campaign trip and then be out there with them in the heat of the sun and trying to witness to lost souls and pass out John and Romans, you might get sick. You might worsen your health. You know, it's going to be hard over there. And, you know, it's better that you serve in your local church. You'll do just as much good. That's what Peter will tell you. You know what Peter will tell you? Peter will tell you that you know, you can just develop a close relationship with Jesus Christ, reading your Bible, praying at home, just as much as going to church. So you don't need to go to church. That's what Peter will tell you. What Peter wants to do? Peter wants to prevent you from getting out of your comfort zone and washing somebody else's feet and experience the joy from it. Spiritual Peter wants to rob you of your joy in serving others. What's your Peter? Is it your job? You got your spiritual excuse? Is it your family? You need to get out of that. You need to break that. Don't let Peter hinder you from washing somebody else's feet and experience the joy. We all have a thousand excuses why we can't get out of our comfort zone. I can't go to church because of this. I can't go on the campaigns because of this. I can't join the church annual trip because of this. I can't join the blowout because of this. And I can't sacrifice and put time in my schedule to go out and visit those other Bible-believing churches over there because of this. I can't go out there and witness to those souls because of this. It's dangerous and stuff like that. I need to develop more wisdom and knowledge. And that's what Peter's job is. It's to prevent you from serving and ministering to those people who need ministry. And it will always be a spiritual Peter. And that will be your cloak at the judgment seat of Christ. And that will be your excuse. When's the last time you got outside of your comfort zone and actually washed somebody else's feet and experienced the joy from it? When's the last time you did that? Notice right here, the next part, the verses read. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Peter saith uh, unto him at verse 9. Peter saith unto him at verse 9. Uh, Lord, not my feet only, but... Also my hands and my head. <laughs> this guy's a hot-headed fella. First he says, don't wash me. And then now he says, wash me all over. You know, what a hot-headed guy. You know what sp spiritual Peter will tell you to do? You're right, you got to wash people's feet. But you know you're not doing enough. You need to wash all over. You know, just witnessing to that one soul is not enough. You've got to witness to more souls out there. And then spiritual Peter, by telling you that, you waste all your time on soul winning rather than taking care of your own family, taking care of your job and finances, and taking care of your own local church. You know what spiritual Peter's job is? Don't just wash the feet. You've got to wash all over. So... 
You got to attend that local Bible-believing church. Amen. And then here's your health where you're getting more sick and you need to watch yourself. And then Peter's job is, I don't care if you're going to get hurt, you should go to church. And then you worsen your health and then you don't attend church for months now because you made the dumb decision to go to church when you should have recovered your health. But then again, there's that other Peter, see, there's that Peter that says, don't wash the feet. That says, because of your health, you shouldn't go to church. Because it's so hard on you. You know what my point is? My point is, don't let Peter tell you what to do. Don't use spiritual excuses to prevent you from washing the right stuff. Look, you and I are grown adults. You and I ought to know what our comfort zone is and what our levels are on how we should wash people's feet. You and I know what our weaknesses are and what our fleshly excuses are that we pretend to be spiritual excuses. We need to repent of those things because they're not Judas Iscariot's. They're Peter's. Judas Iscariot was cast out a long time ago, you got to realize. Judas Iscariot... He's obvious. He's the one that betrays the Lord. He's wicked. He's evil. So guess what? He's not a part of that. He's cast out. What will prevent you from washing people's feet is not a wicked, sinful reason. Do you understand? It won't be a Judas. It will be a spiritual Peter. And you got to watch out for those spiritual Peters. You'll notice right here that uh, the word of God reads at verse 10, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Now, Jesus Christ, he said to Simon Peter, when Peter was saying, then just wash me all over. Don't just wash my feet, wash me all over. Jesus Christ actually told him that you are clean all over. The only thing that needs cleaning is your feet because your feet tend to get dirty all over again. That's what Jesus said. Huh, ain't that interesting? Jesus Christ said all of you are clean every whit, except, you know, Judas Iscariot. That's why he said not all of you are clean. But there's a second thing he said. I don't know if he caught that. There's a second thing that wasn't clean here. The second thing that wasn't clean, even though he said clean every whit, was their feet. Their feet. Why not then? Why not have your feet clean? I mean, Jesus said all of you, all everywhere of your body is clean except your feet. Well, why is that? Why will their feet get dirty but not their whole body, right? If you're thinking about being clean, the idea is this. The idea is, from Jesus' standpoint and point of view, is that all of you are right. All of you are right with God. But there's some part of you that can get dirty, that needs cleaning again, and that is the feet. I always wondered about that. Oh, what's so significant about the feet getting dirty? Why not just have clean feet to begin with then, right? If Jesus said, all of you are clean, every whit, except your feet, my question is, why won't the feet and everywhere just be clean to begin with? Why do they have to get dirty that Jesus has to wash their stinking feet? Can't they just be clean originally in their feet? What's the purpose of getting their feet dirty? Why not get the rest of their body dirty, right? Well, what we do know is this. From top to bottom, excluding their feet, when Jesus says they're clean, that means they're right with God. But there's something about their feet that's just not right, that needs cleansing all the time. If you read the Word of God, uh, the Bible talks about feet as a reference to wherever they go the places that they go. As a matter of fact, the places that they go to, listen, the places that they go to are not clean. 
For one example, Jesus said that when they were ministering to a city, if the city rejects their gospel, their preaching, Jesus says, take the dust off of your, the shoes of your feet and then slap it together. What does that mean? That means their feet were dirty. And they're slapping the dirt against that city. That's how they get their feet dirty. It's by going to places that are dirty and ministering to them the word of God. That's why Jesus wants them to wash their feet. Because when you go to dirty places, you know what you need to do as a Bible-believing Christian? As you go to dirty places and minister to them the word of God, you need to keep yourself sanctified. You need to keep yourself clean. Hey, coming over here and planting a church here is filthy and rotten. Do you understand? This is the Bay Area. I mean, physically, it's filthy and rotten. <laughs> just physically, not just spiritually. And when we come here, we need to keep ourselves clean. But then the question is, why don't we just be clean to begin with? Why do we have to get our feet dirty? Because God wants you to serve people. God wants you to minister to dirty people. God wants you to clean the dirt off of dirty people. That's why he tells you to go to dirty places. And Jesus calls that joy. He calls that joy. You know what Bible believers has a distorted thinking of joy as? Listen, this is the problem with Bible believers that make me very angry. And I come from PBI, so I know what that's like. When I come from there, do you know that I never wanted to come back to California after I graduated? I mean, I got the full-blown orchestra, the percussion, and uh, the singing was just uplifting, and then I get great preaching, and then I get teaching of the Word of God. I get fed. I get brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you know how many young people get married over there? It's easy to find a husband and wife over there compared to here. I mean, you know, it's easier to develop friends over there. It's easy to develop ministries over there. Be a part of the military ministry, street preaching ministry, nursing home ministry. Hey, guess what? I signed up for all of them. Why? Because I'm just a zealot, zealous nut. That's why. I signed up for everything. Military ministry, nursing home ministry, and then I signed up for street preaching ministry, and then I just, uh, I was outside downtown Pensacola street preaching at those bars, you know? I mean... I was a zealous nut, and I lived the time of my life. That was joy to me. Why? To be stuck in a clean place. And who wants to go back to something dirty like California? But you know what Jesus said to me? Real joy is what I call you to do. Get back to dirty California, where your feet are going to get dirty, and clean them up. Okay. Don't just stay stuck in a clean place. You know what the problem with our mentality is? Look, do you know how long it took to develop this clean place here? You know what the danger with some of you are? You're not cleaning other people's feet. You're the one getting your feet cleaned. When you constantly live that way, getting your feet cleaned, and you think that's real joy, that ain't real joy. Can I repeat that again? That ain't real joy. Sitting here, selfishly basking in him singing blowouts and then fellowshipping with each other and then uh, listening to the preach and teaching of the word of God. That ain't real joy! Now, you might get shocked and you might go, no, we receive joy. You're right. But you know what happens when you constantly stay stuck in a clean environment and you don't minister to other people who need cleaning? It becomes a selfish mentality. And you always expect somebody to give you something clean. You always expect that someone's going to wash your feet all the time in here. Oh, what if your pastor gets dirty? You thought about that? Okay. Then what are you going to do? Throw away your faith in Jesus Christ? You know what you need to do? You need to clean somebody's feet. Right. And you can experience real joy. That's why I get mad at Bible believers who, when they have all the gifts, all the knowledge, especially at PBI, 
They just sit on their blessed assurance and then don't get called out to missions. They don't plant churches. They don't minister to lost souls out there. And they're all stuck in comfortable Florida because they got a good governor there, unlike our wretched governor in California. That is selfish. Do you know how many people are dying and going to hell and then out in different countries out there? This is real selfish. We don't need another Bible-believing church in the Bible Belt. Now look, don't get me wrong. If God called you there, right, right. praise the Lord, amen. I'm not making you feel guilty about that, getting you upset. But man, I'm telling you what, I, sometimes I wonder, and I want you to ask yourselves this, and this, hey, look, I'm not talking about Florida. I'm talking about my church here. This is more so my church. Are you the one constantly getting your feet cleaned and enjoying it, and you think that's how you're going to receive joy all the time without washing somebody else's feet, then you'll never experience real, true joy. You know what real, true joy is? Not the one sitting down and writing notes under Bible study, but the one who teaches the word of God and gives it to other people. Not the one who relies on somebody to wash their kids' feet, but they're the ones who washes their own children's feet because they're the dad, they're the mom, they're the parent. That's joy right there. Real joy. You wash the feet. You don't get other, you don't become dependent on people washing your feet. You know, what, you know what you are? Are you the one getting your feet washed every time you line up in the kitchen? Or do you experience the joy of washing other people's feet as you bring food? <clears throat> as you're the one who cleans up the dishes and cleans up the church? Are you the one experiencing that joy? Are you the one... Getting out of your comfort zone here. I know this is a clean place. We got it made. But the only reason why you can enjoy this is because somebody here kept washing your feet. It's now time you get out of that. Get out of your comfortable chair and start washing somebody's feet out there because we got plenty out there. Don't be selfish and just keep coming to church and get your feet washed. Get out there. Bring others. You need to get your feet dirty and you need to go to dirty places. Not because you're deliberately trying to get yourself dirty. It's because you're getting into the dirt to get them cleaned. There's an appreciation. There's a stronger appreciation when you actually go out and see the dirt and experience cleanliness compared to just knowing and experiencing cleanliness. What do you mean by that, preacher? If you and I had a blowout every day, do you think, those of you who went to Europe with me, in that meeting, in that uh, small room over there, just like other typical Bible-believing churches are, do you think you and I would really enjoy a great time? If we had a blowout every day. Why is it that time at Europe that we enjoy, we experience the joy of the Lord over there? You know why? We didn't get everything clean and perfect. And people in that room knew what it was like to be dirty. In Switzerland, in Germany, and in Europe, it's so dirty and dark there. So because of that, when they came to a small little room like that, they felt like they were getting washed and they experienced joy. You and I, we got out of our comfort zone and because we were just craving for church, craving for other people, we know what it's like to be dirty in California and we know how dirty Europe is, but to see them all cleanly singing hymns, cleanly fellowshipping, that gave us joy. You know what really stirred our hearts to give us joy? I'll tell you one thing, Robert looked really happy when he was preaching. You know why? He saw the dirt of the stinking Roman Catholic churches there. I never saw him more happy in all my life when he was preaching. I had to calm him down. I was like, you got to calm down a bit, you know. <laughs> you know what that is? Because you saw the dirt. But if all you see is clean, 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 and then what happens? Feet that never walk on dirt road 
don't become stronger and they become lame really fast and dependent and soft. You know what I'm seeing nowadays? I'm preaching hard here. I'm seeing Bible believers who are second generation, third generation, becoming a bunch of softy pansies nowadays. It ain't just like the first generation back then who experienced dirt and knew what dirt was like. And then when they got clean, they experienced the joy of the Lord. But because we got second generation, third generations coming out and all they experienced was cleanliness, then you know what happened? They became dependent, weak, soft, and they don't know what real joy is. Because they never ministered to something dirty out there. You know how I got something real? I got out of my little shelter of a homeschool life. Clean home life. My dad's church. That was a clean place. I, to, I didn't want to get out of there. I had to come out here all by myself in UC Berkeley and other stinking, hellish, damnable universities and people and, you know, sodomites trying to hit on me, you know, while I'm street preaching and all that kind of garbage. But ministering to dirty people and seeing them cleaned and ending up here gave me more joy than back at Pensacola, than back at PBI, than back at my home church, at my dad's church. I am living the time of my life right now all because I was washing people's dirty feet. This is the highlight of my life. You told me this 14 years ago, that I would be the happiest man planning a church over here. I would not believe you. This came from washing people's dirty feet, not just sticking to a clean place doing nothing. You know who appreciates those hymn singings of Sinners Saved by Grace? You know who appreciates those songs about God hath not promised and suffering? Those who got hurt by the dirt. Those who experienced the hurt and the harm of the dirt. But if all they experienced was clean, 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 discontentment can come out real fast. We'll notice right here that uh, in verse 12, Jesus asked them, Know ye what I have done to you? Verse 13, he said, You call me Master and Lord, and ye say ye well, for so I am. Verse 14, he said, If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. This is very important. Jesus Christ, he was pointing out to his disciples. Now, did you see what I'm doing here while I'm washing your feet? Yes, Lord, you washed my feet. You cleansed it. Thank you so much. Thank you for cleaning me. Thank you for washing me. Thank you for loving me enough to serve me and ministering to me. Hallelujah. And Jesus like, no, 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 you're missing out the point here. I'm washing your feet so that not only you experience the joy of getting your feet washed, but that you can wash other people's feet. Oh, no one likes that part, right? Anyone can say glory to God, hallelujah, if Jesus cleansed your life, but when you clean somebody else's life, that ain't fun. I think there's something we don't understand here. When God gave you grace in your life and blessings in your life, do you understand it's not just personally to you? Now, I know that when Jesus died on the cross, for example, or when he gives blessing in our lives, we make it personal, right? It's for me. But I think we're totally misunderstanding here. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not just for you. You're not that important. He died for everyone, that everyone can take it personally to themselves. But that personal thing is also inclusive with the collective, with everybody out there. The point is this, for God to give his blessings on you, it's not just for you, it's for everyone. When God died on the cross to give you salvation, it's not just for you, it's for everyone. When God made a promise to take care of you, that's not just for you, that's for everyone. When God promised to give you joy, that's not just for you, that's for everyone. 
What does that mean? What that means then is this. Stop hogging it to yourself and give it to other people. But do you know how many Christians are hogging it to themselves, the joy of the Lord, the promises of God, the blessings, and not giving it to other people? Has God answered your prayer recently on something? All right, then are you using it to bless others? Or is it just yours? Did God bless you with something in your life and you're thankful to God for it? All right, you're going to hog it or give it to others. You know what joy is? Joy is not limited to one person. It's an infectious thing that affects everybody. That's what joy is. It should not be hogged. It should not be limited. Are you thankful for the grace God gives to you during the trial and suffering? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I sure am thankful to God for that. I would be killed. I would die without God's grace on my life during suffering. Why did God give me that grace then? It's not just for me. It's for others too. Didn't the Bible say that our suffering is to minister to other people's suffering? Here's the thing, church. If you want God to keep blessing your life, being good to you, giving you his grace during the trial and suffering, you better start giving it to other people. If you're not then why should God keep blessing you? If you're not, why should God keep answering your prayers? If you're not, why should God give you the grace to endure the trial that you're going through? You're not getting enough grace from God? Then maybe it's because you're not using that grace properly. Hey, if you think I'm lying, Romans 12 talks about the gifts of grace, they called it. Something to think about, huh? You know what the love of Christ is? The love of Christ is not just me. It's include everybody. And that's what we're trying to give to other people. That's why serving others is very important. Do you understand? It gives real joy. Real joy is not limited to one hogging it. Real joy is when everybody is included in the picture here. I wonder if God kept blessing this church because people kept giving to others. And I wonder if God will slow down the blessings in this church as we keep hogging it more to ourselves. The last part I want to read is verse 16 and 17. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Jesus promised you will be happy if you know that the service that you do is based upon the fact <coughs> the servant is not greater than his Lord. And Jesus specifically pointed out that the one that sent him is not uh, that he is greater than the one being sent. What Jesus is pointing out right here is that God is supreme. He is the greatest. Knowing that fact, that he's greater than the servants is the one that gives you joy and meaning in life. Now, do you understand from Jesus' statement what he's saying here? Jesus did not put himself, listen, in this verse, he did not put himself as the perfect almighty being as the master up there. You know what he put himself in these two verses? As the servant serving the Lord. And he says, by doing that, there is joy. You know what, how big this is? This is very big. If you had everything perfect in life, as much as heaven itself, as much as the master of the universe had everything perfect in his life, and had everything right in your life, it is not much. It is not much as much joy to have a, everything perfect in your life, being in a perfect position like God, it is not as much joy compared to what? Taking the role of servitude. You ever thought about that before? 
You know, you thought that if you have all your bills perfected, if you had your job perfected, if you have your health just perfect, and if you have the ministry just right, and if you had the people just right, and everything perfect, you would really be happy? Jesus Christ said, no. The one who does the servitude, not the one who's the Lord who has all everything perfect, the one who serves and realizes his or her position, that's more joy. Happy are ye if you recognize I'm not the perfect one with the perfect Lord, the perfect everything. I'm just a lowly servant. Who's speaking here? The one who experienced perfection as God and as humble, lowly servant man. Now look, Jesus Christ, he can always be happy being perfect God or a servant. He's perfect in everything. But when Jesus quotes this verse, it's to us. Because a lot of us don't understand this. God can have a perfect heaven and have perfect satisfaction and joy and perfect everything and then also be a servant and maintain the right attitude and spirit. But ourselves, on the other hand, we have to realize this. We are not self-sustaining self people like God. God, He is infinite, self-sustaining. He can take care of Himself. But you and I, we're not perfect. We cannot sustain ourselves. And Jesus, experiencing the perfect realms and the realm of servitude, realized our place to, main, to remain happy is a place of servitude not a place of getting everything perfect. If you don't think so, try to be the one getting everything perfect in your life. Are you receiving joy? Have you been chasing, chasing after things that flee away from you because you're trying to get everything perfect? Do you know how stressful and sad of a life that is? Aren't you sick and tired of that? Why do you have to keep getting the perfect role, the perfect everything? Then you'll never be happy. It's time to let those things go, don't you think so? And it's time to take the role of a servant. Take the role of a servant and just trust and obey God that what he called you to do to serve others, that brings you real joy. But if you don't want that, then do what every American is doing right now. Make your job perfect, make your family perfect, make your life perfect, health perfect, and everything. Be the master, be the Lord. But it's such a miserable life because you cannot sustain yourself. You get sick and tired, you reach a limit. But being a servant, you're not self-sustaining. When you serve others, others sustain you. When you serve God, God sustains you. I don't know about you, but I could use some God in my life to sustain me. And I could use people out there to sustain me. Because I'm sick and tired of being self-sustaining. And that's the lie from wicked America is to be independent and self-sustaining. It's a huge lie. And people are more miserable and sad than ever before. I need God and I need others. So what I'll do is let my perfect world go and just serve others and then they can sustain me. Has God been really sustaining your life? If he hasn't, then let's serve him a little more. Every head bow and every eye shut.